we have Dr. Alcindor. So Dr. Alcindor, when I looked at his, he submitted a poster originally. When I looked at his poster, it was so fabulous. And I thought perhaps it would be instructive, informative to have Dr. Alcindor present an oral. And so he is here today. Uh, we are, one of the things that we really tried to do was to, to make sure we had a diverse group of people from across the spectrum. And so we wanted to really make sure that our illustrious HBCU uh, faculty and students were here. And as I introduce the North Carolina A&T students, I also want to introduce Dr. Alcindor as being a faculty member with a joint appointment with Meharry and with Vanderbilt. And so he is a virologist. And I thought that his insights about the whole pandemic would be very, very instructive for all of us. So I am going to leave it to Dr. Alcindor to give you more information about himself and about his research and then go into his presentation. Dr. Okay. Alcindor. Yes, yeah, so I wear a lot of hats. And one of the most important ones is my work with the Tennessee SEAL. So there are 11 SEAL teams around the United States, and they are designed to bring efforts that re reduce vaccine hesitance and improve vaccine uptake in particular states that are highly vulnerable to COVID-19. And Tennessee is one of those states. And so I am the director of research for the state of Tennessee SEAL program. I am also the director of the Tennessee Health Works Consortium with Morehouse School of Medicine. And so we get together and I do a lot of writing. I write curriculum for the COVID-19 healthcare workers that we're hiring to help with this. I also give presentations to the NIH. This project is supported by NHLBI. It is also supported by HRSA. And so I do a lot of different things. And so uh, I've been on the vaccine injury and compensation program since I was a postdoc at Johns Hopkins. And at Hopkins, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Hildred, who is the current president of Meharry. And Dr. Hildred, when he left Johns Hopkins, he wanted to bring a Hopkins team with him to Meharry. And I had never heard of Meharry Medical College when I was at Johns Hopkins. But I'm glad I did. And the opportunities I got at Meharry Medical College far out <laughs> distanced the opportunities I had at Johns Hopkins. Low ceiling, so to speak. But being on the Vaccine Injury and Compensation Program, what my job was at that time is to write affidavits for people that were injured because they got a vaccine or perceived to be injured. And so I remember having a case of a young boy who got an MMR vaccine and he developed autism after that. And there was claims made by his doctor that the vaccine gave the boy autism. And so what I did is had to look through all of the child's records since the day he was born until four years old. And so that's a lot of records. And so uh, UPS shows up at your house with a giant box and you have to look at all of these records and come up with an opinion. And you write that opinion as an affidavit. And the idea is that it was very clear to me that when you understand the biology of viruses, then you can come in with a very hard answer about things. I'm gonna tell you today more about COVID-19 than anybody else have ever told you. And so I have disclosures. So I developed a drug, and this is the first drug developed for COVID-19 at an HBCU. It was MRCV-19, my Harry's response to COVID-19. And the idea is I've also developed a reagent for Zika virus and other reagents. And again, I, I put Zika virus here because I think we did some miscalculations when we thought Zika would behave very similar to COVID, that it would just go away. COVID didn't go away. And so here, I just want to give you an idea of this drug that we developed. And the idea, this is the COVID viral genome here. It's about 30 kilobases or 30,000 bases long. This is the spike protein region that is the target antigen for all of the vaccines that we have right now, except with the exception of the 
uh, Omicron bivalent vaccine that was recently uh, given emergency youth authorization. And so right here is what we call the five prime UTR. You see very little changes, but look at the area where the spike protein is. You see a multitude of mutations in this area, indicating you could get many changes in this virus if you made an antigen for a fundamental vaccine using this area of the proteins. And so what I decided to do is make something where you had very little mutation. So I developed a reagent we refer to as a in vivo morpholino to basically bind to this region of the virus and inhibit virus replication. So this is the COVID-19 virus binding to its cognate receptor, that is the ACE2 receptor. It gets into the cell and the viral genome is released. My MRCV19 product would then bind to the 5' UTR of the virus and prevent any viral proteins being made. It would shut the virus down completely. Now this protein, well this reagent that I made, this Marfolino, would work with a, a mouse virus, it would work with a virus found in monkeys, a virus in bats, and so forth. Just because this is very common to all of the coronaviruses, the human coronaviruses. And the rate of mutation down here is much less than the rate of mutation here. This is MRCV19 target, this is the spike protein, this is where I made the reagent at the 5' UTR. This is the in vivo Marfolino, and this was published in the journal Biomedicines. So when we think about the coronavirus, the coronavirus is still here with us. This morning, the numbers 1,090,338 people have died of COVID-19 in the United States. That's quite serious. And the idea is we have about 250 to 300 people dying every day. An average seven day average of about 37,000 people being infected. We know that people that are vaccinated are also being infected as well. We know people that are treated with things like Paxlovid and Melnuprevir, which are antivirals for COVID-19, they're getting rebound infections as well. So this is problematic. But the world was captured by this virus. To give you a background of coronaviruses, there are seven different coronaviruses that infect humans. The four commonly circulating coronaviruses have been with us since the 1960s. They infect children all the time, and they can infect children multiple times by the same virus. But as of 2003, something different happened. We had the first human coronavirus, we call the beta human coronavirus, called SARS. This is the first virus of the commonly circulating coronaviruses that would cause a condition called acute respiratory distress. Now, acute respiratory distress, what does that mean? It means that this is a type of lung failure that if you get it, the likelihood of dying is quite serious. And so, this is what this virus looks like in a cartoon. These are the spikes, the so-called crown or corona that's given its name. And the idea is that the ones in red, generally harmless in the general population, been around for a long time. Unless you have a suppressed immune system, the ones in red won't cause you any trouble. The ones in blue are dangerous, very dangerous. The SARS virus in 2003 had a fatality rate of 10%. The MERS virus that is transmitted by way of the dromedary species, that is a camel, it occurred in the Middle East, this virus has a fatality rate of 35%. A virus with a fatality rate of 35% would kill a neighbor off, kill off a neighborhood in a matter of months. These viruses, to our surprise, did not survive very long out there infecting people, and we're very grateful. But this virus was altogether different. And so when we look at this family as a group, the commonly circulating coronavirus, and the three that cause ARDS. And again, you can see here the outbreak dates, the number of people infected, the number of people died. Only eight people in the United States were infected with the SARS-CoV-1 virus. The MERS virus, 35% mortality rate, 27 countries, only nine, 895 deaths. But look at SARS-CoV-2. 
a fatality rate of 3 to 5 percent, 3 to 5 percent, and again, an ongoing pandemic, more than 190 countries, and again, across the world, 6.56 million people have died of this disease. And so, one of the things that I'm concerned about is this SARS-CoV-2 virus can infect domestic animals as well. We know that the bat is a zoological intermediate host for the coronavirus, and of course, this virus has been found to infect some of these animals. And again, a virus that undergoes a mutation event that comes out of one of these animals and are transmissible to humans could be problematic. Problematic in ways that we can't imagine. And so if we're going to monitor wastewater for SARS-CoV-2, I think we ought to monitor this virus in animal species as well. So a zoonotic host leading to a transmission event could be a virus that we wouldn't be able to deal with. And so this is my quote here. Poor social determinants of health is a driver of comorbidities that predispose underserved communities to the most severe complications of COVID-19. And so let's look at these predisposed comorbidities. When we look at them, you can go back to China where people that were obese had a very difficult time with this virus. And when, you have, when you're obese, you have a likelihood of pulmonary disease. You have the likelihood of stroke, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension. So along with that general condition, you have these underlying comorbidities. They will get worse as you age. And when you look at the dangers in terms of kilos and COVID-19 hospitalization admissions by 10, 000, per 10,000, what you see clearly is that BMI is directly related to hospitalizations due to COVID-19. Now, our people and where they work and how that predisposes them to COVID-19. The prevalence of health conditions by way of race, and again, medical conditions, non-Hispanic black, Hispanics and whites, you can see in terms of hypertension. Obesity, diabetes that's diagnosed or undiagnosed in asthma, higher in communities of color, inherently higher. And so a virus that can take advantage of this would be a virus that can drive health disparities. Where we work, grocery and convenience stores, public transit, warehouses, childcare, cleaning buildings, you can see that black and brown communities are essential workers that are directly exposed to COVID-19. I was looking at CNN one night, and one of the broadcasters said that if you had hypertension, diabetes, lung disease, and so forth, that you, bet you better watch out because you're going to have a problem with COVID-19. And then nobody said why that is. I decided to write about why that is. And this is the editor's choice in the Journal of Clinical Medicine that I wrote here, explaining the racial disparities associated with COVID-19 mortality in minority populations. So let's talk about diabetes. So when you look at diabetes, and again, this is one of the increased risk factors for COVID-19, more severe disease among those people with diabetes. Normal blood glucose level, clinical presentations can be normal or hypoglycemic. Again, SARS-CoV-2 infection, the first thing that will happen in a clinical setting is a person that will develop a pro-inflammatory cytokine storm. The treatment for that in the clinic is corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are contraindicated for a person with high blood glucose levels. The idea is that it will drive blood glucose levels even higher, and that's been associated with injury to the lung and poor clearance of virus once you're infected. Let's look at hypertension. So, when you think of the normal way blood pressure is controlled here, the liver makes a, a, an enzyme called angiotensinogen. Renin in the kidney converts that to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is usually converted by ACE1 to angiotensin 2. This angiotensin 2 is very dangerous because it hangs around a long time. And the idea is that because ACE2 can be sequestered by a virus infecting a person, and ACE2 now is not available to convert angiotensin II to a more 
vasodilating, anti-inflammatory, antioxidative product, what happens is that angiotensin II levels build up, lead to increased vasoconstriction, a rise in blood pressure in those individuals, fibrosis, oxidative stress. This can lead to respiratory failure in those patients, resulting in lung disease, kidney, heart, and damage of blood vessels. This can lead to pulmonary edema. And of course, this is an individual that will be on their way to mechanical ventilation, ICU admissions. Let's look at heart disease. So the idea is that it's been shown that ACE2 receptors are present on cardiomyocytes, directly on heart tissue. That means the virus can directly infect the heart. The idea of these cardiomyocytes, over time, can undergo hypoxia with excessive intracellular calcium leading to cardiomyocyte apoptosis. These cells will die off. And over time, you get myocardial injury. That mitocardial injury can be permanent. It can give a person ischemia. It can cause you to have uh, certain types of heart ailments that can be present. Those people that survive can develop what we call long COVID that gives them continual heart issues. Now, we save the, the last because this is the target organ for this virus, the lungs. So a person that has COPD, a current smoker, has interstitial lung disease or asthma. And again, people that have COPD and a current smoker, they have increased levels of the virus binding protein on their pulmonary epithelial cells. The idea is that this virus will make its way into the lower lung. And if it does, it's looking for one particular cell type. That is the type 2 pneumocyte. This virus then will infect this cell, and depending upon the extent of damage, your life is in the balance. It will say if you will go to ICU, it will say if you survive or not. The next slide shows that. So this is the dividing line here. On this side, these are people that will survive COVID. On this side, these are people that won't. And this is a situation where you have re resident alveolar macrophages that are doing their business, meaning they serve as janitors inside the alveoli. And the idea is that they produce surfactants and so forth. These type 2 pneumocytes that trim the walls here, they are very thin cells. The idea, they're ideal for gas exchange. That gas exchange happens between these type 1 pneumocytes and the endothelium of the pulmonary capillary. Without this gas exchange, you're in trouble. And this is how it happens. You have COVID-19 COVID coming in. It infects these type 2 pneumocytes, causing a tremendous inflammation hurricane in your lungs. That inflammation hurricane leads to reactive oxygen species, cellular debris. And what happens is that this sends off an alarm. Cells come out of the, out of the vasculature to see what's going on here. They bring their payload, and they cause more damage. The extent of alveolar damage is the difference between life and death when it comes to COVID-19, meaning that if you just pass COVID off as a cold or a flu, and it gets to the point where the alveolar damage is, is to the extent, there is nothing that will help you survive COVID-19. This was a turning point in this epidemic. On April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, what you saw with bodies being loaded up into refrigerated cars in New York City. We had nearly 5,000 people dying every day in the United States. There was no turning back here. We had to do something. Something that the Trump administration did right is on this wall now, and that is Operation Warp Speed. The Trump administration said, we're going to give you $10 billion, about a half a dozen companies, and we want you to do one thing, well, a few things. We want 300 million doses of a safe and effective vaccine by January 1st, 2021. Only two companies could do that. And so the idea is that to do that, you had to go to extremes. 10 to 12, 10 to 15 years to build a vaccine from the day of antigen discovery to distribution into the population, 10 to 15 years. They were asking you to do it in nine months. That's a big call. But the reason you have a chance to do that is money is no option. 
when money is no option. And he said to all of them, no litigation unless there's negligence. Meaning that if something happens, it happens. But the idea, if you show negligence, then they can come after you. So you give a company, companies that money and everything, they're going to do this. And this is what they do. In general, this is what it takes. From the exploratory phase to develop an antigen, the preclinical models in mice or in monkeys, and then going to the clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three, and then submitting a drug application to the FDA. The time involved here is considerable. Imagine on April 1, 2020, when 5,000 people were dead in the United States every day. Imagine letting that go for 10 to 15 years, what it would look like. It was an emergency. And this is how they did it. They took everything they learned from the HIV vaccine efforts, and they brought it to bear on developing a COVID vaccine. So what they did is something that is unheard of, and that is to start manufacturing at the same time you start phase clinical one trials. Nobody does that. But if you have money to burn, you can. And what they did is when clinical trial phase one started, they started phase two. And then when phase two, before it was finished, they started phase three. This right here will save five to seven years. And a whole lot of dollars, too. And the idea is that manufacturing started at the beginning. Who would ever do that? You're saying to yourself, whatever I make is going to be good enough. That's what you're really saying. It turns out that was the case. So it was produced quickly. The FDA stepped out of the way. They said there's only one criteria that whatever you make has to be 50% effective. They made something that was 94% effective. Only two companies could do it, Pfizer and Moderna. And it turns out Pfizer was the first on the 11th, Moderna came on the 18th. And they were able to do this in December. It was ready. mRNA vaccines, we had never seen this, but these guys had a lot of experience with these mRNA vaccines. In Ebola and SARS-1, they developed early vaccines for those, and of course, Moderna, a company that had never put out an FDA-approved drug in its history and nearly went bankrupt more than once, was now touted by the Trump administration to be one of the companies to lead the way. Novavax had the same history. And so what we had is four vaccines today that are fully approved by the FDA, only one of them was made in the United States only. The others were international. When you think about vaccines, it's important because in other countries, they had other viruses there. So you can test your vaccine against other viruses. So this is something I published in vaccines. And the idea is that what we had is we had people that were having breakthrough infections. But it turns out is that what they did in this clinical trial, well, well in this study, is they looked at people that were working in the hospital. And they looked at taking samples from them on a regular basis. And they said, to, how many of these people would develop breakthrough infections over time? What was the antibody levels when that happened? What they found is that the level of neutralizing antibodies that they had at the time when they seroconverted and became PCR positive for the virus dictated whether they got a breakthrough infection or not. So they were able to learn what you needed in order to prevent a breakthrough infection. So these vaccines had a lot that was wrong with them. And no vaccine is 100% effective. That is clear. And these vaccines had their doubters. But the idea was this. These were all very rare events, very rare. But the public didn't really get that. Anaphylaxis, anaphylactic shock can be problematic, but everywhere you go to get a vaccine, there is norepinephrine there just in case you develop anaphylaxis. Again, one in a million vaccinated will develop anaphylaxis. I have never seen it. And again, Guillain-Barre syndrome, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, myocarditis and pericarditis in young boys in their, as teenagers. Again, the likelihood, look, 2.13 per 100,000. But it's very difficult to explain that to a person at a vaccine event. She just wants to know that I don't want my son to have this condition if he gets that vaccine. And again, death associated with that, 
0.0022%. Person comes to me at a vaccine event, tells me that her grandfather was 97 years old. He got the vaccine on Saturday. He was dead on Monday. And so I say to her that causation <laughs> is unlikely here with all the, all the extenuating circumstances. So I tell mothers this vaccine is important because this vaccine will provide through colostrum, that is the early milk, antibodies that will be with that baby for some time at the very early stages and protect that baby over time. So that vaccination induces antibodies, protect that infant, and again, going down at about six months, but again, at that early window when he can be or she can be infected. And so it's very clear that by lactation, that is by breastfeeding, or by placental transfer, you have antibodies that will protect that baby over time. And it's important. We have a lot of experience with vaccines, and I talk to parents all the time about vaccinating their children, and they're very hesitant about it. And so I try to explain to them that they have a tremendous amount of experience with vaccines. Think about it. In the 1960s, we had five vaccines available to us in the United States as a country polio, smallpox, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. That was it. But look what happened. In 1986, you could see it went to 24 and 83. In 1986, the liability shield said that, look, no litigation against vaccine companies unless they show negligence. And the idea is that vaccine schedules rose in 2019 from a baby being born to 18 years old in the United States, you'll get 74 vaccinations. And so the idea is that vaccines have been safe and affected for decades. Vaccines are among the most important, highly scrutinized public health interventions we have ever known. Vaccines allow us to live 30 years longer than we did 100 years ago. So when we look at measles, pertussis, mumps, there are some people in here that can remember when mumps killed babies. How many people in here have heard of mumps killing a baby or measles killing a baby? And the reason being is because of vaccines. And so when you look at this, you can see smallpox has been eradicated through Dr. Hatcher's talk. Again, polio at a very low level, but we've seen it spring its head up in New York City recently. And so there is concern. There's a very good vaccine for polio. Again, we have to deal with people that are out there putting out misinformation about vaccines, and these are referred to as anti-vaxxers. And what they're doing is that they're using often this misinformation to sometime benefit off. And I'll give you an example with measles in New York City. In Brooklyn, New York, it turned out there were a number of Jew communities that did not want to vaccinate their children for measles. They refused to. One of them went to the Philippines where measles was on fire at the time. They came back to the United States. These children were living in the house, going homeschooling, and living with measles. And the idea is that they got together. The mayor of New York City prohibited the mandate of giving them religious exemptions for measles and, of course, made these people vaccinate. They had to talk to rabbis. And when it turned out, the anti-vaxxers were telling these people that there were pork products in the vaccine. And the idea of that little bit of misinformation led though, that Jewish community to not vaccinate for measles. And so the United States about to lose its hold on measles, and they have kept measles at bay for the last decade. And so I get this every time I go to a vaccine event. What's in a vaccine? And again, people are very hesitant. I tell them vaccines are mainly water. There are some preservatives to keep the vaccine uh, shelf life going. Residual trace elements, there could be an adjuvant. This will make the vaccine more potent as an immunogen when they give it to you. And in a small amount of a harmless form of the bacteria or virus, and is not the whole bacteria or virus, OK? So the last word on vaccines. Like I said, safe and effective for decades. Vaccines go through phase one, phase two, phase three trials. 
And again, there's a data safety monitoring board. Then it goes to the FDA advisory board that I have had the privilege of sitting on for many years. And of course, then the FDA and again, CDC guidance for distribution in the population. And again, we see that vaccines will have side effects. These side effects are usually mild. Now, what we're dealing with now is that we're making vaccines to chase these variants. And I predicted that at one time. And this is the reason why we're doing it. And so when you look at the spike protein itself, and I drew a cartoon of it here, there's this RBD, what we call the, uh, the receptor binding domain. This is the ACE protein that are on your cells, in your lungs, or wherever. It is looking to bind to this RBD domain. This guy is famous for having many mutations, but it's those mutations, it can still bind to this ACE2 receptor. It can be more efficient or less efficient. When these mutations happen, these viruses can be transmitted. The ones that are transmitted can be more infectious and evade the immune system in a more serious way and cause more disease. The Delta variant was a prime example of a virus that was an absolute killer of this population. And so what we've seen over the course, here I have the coronavirus genome here. You can see very few mutations down at the five prime end. But look at the spike protein end where we have made uh, all our vaccines to. Many mutations in this area. We have gone through many lineages of these virus from alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Now we're dealing with Omicron. And most recently, in the last month, we have a new variant called the BA2 7.52, highly resistant, only 0.5% in the general population and across the world. And the idea is, is that, remember the Delta virus in India was the same way. So we could be looking at a quiet storm here. We have to be vigilant and understand that we are not done with this virus. So, I want to show you how this virus is changing, and it's changing in ways that are not beneficial to us. And the idea is that you see the alpha variant, the beta, the gamma, the delta, and now the omicron. I want you to look at the span of mutations that exist in these viruses, and what you can see is that as these viruses evolve, you see an increase in mutation events in the viral genome, suggesting that the virus now is what we, is what referred to as under immune pressure to change in order to escape the protection you get from vaccinations. The virus is always trying to adapt itself to survive. And it will continue to do that. And the idea is that when that happens, you have a mutation that occurs, gives that virus an advantage, and now it becomes dominant in the population. I wrote this about breakthrough infections in the journal Vaccines recently. And here, the dynamics of this breakthrough infection is that you see these neutralizing antibodies that you have, over time, they will go down, requiring you to get a booster to bring them back up. And again, immune suppression. Some people have immune suppressive diseases. They take immune suppressive drugs, like for cancer and so forth, as they get older genetics that might predispose them to breakthrough infections. That's not going to change. The idea is to stay boosted and update your boosting. And so <clears throat> I've talked about this already. These viruses are very different depending upon their mutations. Some of these viruses can grow in the lung and produce something we call syncytia. These syncytia are viruses, a pack of cells that are infected with the virus like a clump of cells. Now, for the virus to infect other cells, it doesn't have to come outside of that cell. It can infect cells by passing in between cells, shielding itself from the mucosal immune response. Now, this is something that we have to talk about if we talk about COVID, and that is the development of long COVID. And we know of people that have developed long COVID. And the idea here is that a virus infection over time, and after four weeks, you're still having lingering symptoms of COVID. You are at the level of having long COVID. If this continues up to 12 weeks, you're considered to have chronic post-COVID syndrome. 
And so this syndrome can leave a person unable to work. Headaches, arrhythmias, kidney disease, hypertension, long COVID can produce all of these things in people. And so when we think about vaccinations and hospitalizations, what is very clear is that when we look at the rate of hospitalizations from February 21 to August 21, where they did this study, those people that were vaccinated, 4.5 per 100,000, and those that were unvaccinated, you can see, multiple times over. So being vaccinated will keep you out of the hospital and out of the graveyard. Long COVID happens to everybody. Young children will develop long COVID. These are the common symptoms that you see. They can be serious. Some of these can be life-threatening as well. And some people have had this going on more than a year. And again, long COVID now is considered a disability. And so what you have in these people is brain fog, shortness of breath, heart arrhythmias, and hypertension. Can you imagine not being hypertensive, getting a COVID infection, and then having high blood pressure afterwards? Or for that matter, cardiac arrhythmias. For those individuals that are young guys, young women, that say, I had COVID, I didn't have no problems with it. The idea is this. They looked at young people that had asymptomatic responses to COVID. They did CT scannings of the lung in those young people. And what they found is evidence of lung scarring in those people that had no problems with COVID. Now, this lung scarring over time can heal. But the question then becomes, can lung scarring predispose you to pulmonary disease in the future? We will know. And so when we look at long COVID, there's a number of predictors here. If you're older and you get COVID, if you're in ICU or mechanical ventilation, you're likely to have long COVID. Certain symptoms, female, and again, elevated labs of so, and underlying comorbidities. All of these predispose you as a higher risk of developing long COVID over time. And so we know that this can be a problem. And so when we look at long COVID, you have acute disease. Some people will fully recover. Those that have long COVID believe that there's viral persistence in the body. The virus persists. And even though you've been vaccinated, the virus still persists. There may be systematic tissue inflammation that never goes away. And again, there could be reactivation of other virus families that undergo latency that can cause severe disease associated with long COVID. And again, it's believed that maybe the gut bacteria that you have is undergoing certain types of changes that lead to, that contribute to symptoms of long COVID. And again, microvascular dysfunction because long COVID-19 has been shown to cause problems with vascular systems. And of course, specific autoreactive responses by your immune system that never turns off. What people don't know is that if you have long COVID, Getting the vaccine before, during, or after long COVID would reduce your symptoms of associated with long COVID. So the vaccine also has a place even for people that have existing conditions associated with long COVID. And so pregnant women is another group of people that I'm strongly uh, working with now. And again, it is very clear that when you become pregnant, you have a shift in your immune physiology as a pregnant woman. And the idea is this, in order to care for that baby, your body changes. Your immune system now turns down a little bit. And the idea is that you have increased pulmonary and cardio, cardiopulmonary load as a pregnant woman in order to carry this child. That increased cardiopulmonary load makes you susceptible to respiratory tract infections like COVID. And pregnant women are at higher risk of COVID for symptomatic disease, uh, hospital admissions, ICU admissions, mechanical ventilation, and death. And I've talked to ICU nurses at Vanderbilt and telling me that babies go home, but the mother does not. And so what's currently recommended for pregnant women, and that is COVID is going to be in this mix. That's for sure. And again, I'm interested in pregnant women getting all of the vaccines that recommended. That includes Tdap and influenza as well. And so, an expecting mother, increased cardiopulmonary load, she is carrying a semi-allogeneic fetus. And again, this is because of the father. And again, 
the, the, the baby is of mixed antigen load, okay? Immune tolerance, she has to go through this. She goes from a T1 to a T2 response in terms of immune recognition. And the idea is that she's increased risk for respiratory pathogens like influenza and COVID. If she's vaccinated, then it's a reduced risk for all of this. If she's unvaccinated, she has an increased risk for mortality, hospitalization, symptomatic disease, and neonatal complications. The baby. The baby is also at serious risk as well. And again, if the mother is unvaccinated, preterm birth, birth trophoblast necrosis, placental insufficiency, and prenatal death in those children. And so this study, 70% increase in death in pregnant women that are unvaccinated. That's really what this slide is showing. They did a study with 1,400 plus pregnant women that were hospitalized with COVID. And of course, one in three developed pneumonia and required mechanical ventilation. One in six was admitted to ICU. Nine out of 10 of them were unvaccinated. One in 100 didn't make it. And so pregnant women are not getting their COVID-19 vaccines from the beginning of the pandemic until today. They're not getting their COVID-19 vaccines. And we are out there and we are having baby showers, community baby showers to get pregnant women to get their vaccinations and they're not. And so everything that we experience in terms of infectious disease runs through or filtered through our social determinants of health. And so when we look at this, for those individuals that received at least one dose of a vaccine up to July 2022, you can see people of color are behind. And when we look at the, the, the new booster, that is the bivalent Omicron booster in terms of the uptake in the general population, the general population, only 4% of the eligible folks for the new Omicron booster has taken up this booster. This is demoralizing for people that are trying to prevent COVID out there. And so I published this paper as well. Uh, and, and what I wanted to show here is how the South is very different than many other places. And the idea is that I, I put Tennessee because I'm in Tennessee. And the idea is that this is the counties. There are 95 counties in Tennessee. And again, those big counties that have infrastructure uh, schools and all of those things, airports and that kind of stuff, they have higher vaccination rates for COVID-19. When you go to the rural communities, and again, most of Tennessee's, about 78 of Tennessee counties are rural counties, you see in these rural counties conservative ways of doing things. They simply don't want a vaccine. The pastors will tell you, don't come to my church with a mask on. These kinds of things, making people that are trying to vaccinate folks have a difficult job at doing it. And so what I'm saying is that Tennessee is a microcosm of the South. And the idea is that the 12 Southern states, and we call this the citadel of health disparities. You know what I'm saying? And the idea is that you see, and you can count them off. And it was back in November here that this was published, November 2021. You can see lower vaccination rates, higher infection rates, and again, higher disparity levels and so forth, higher deaths and that kind of thing in some of these states. And so we decided to look at surveys by way of the Tennessee SEAL study design. These surveys were administered 1,482 participants. Uh, these were predominantly medically underserved participants in the state of Tennessee. We did this at pop-up events, cultural gatherings, churches, places of worship, pediatric clinics parks and small businesses, nursing home and living assisted facilities. We did survey analysis and we took that general data and put it on spreadsheets. And of course then uh, we also did vaccinations through the Meharry Pediatric Clinic, our mobile unit that we have at Meharry, our mobile program, and the vaccine strike teams that we have with Vanderbilt and other af affiliate uh, groups. And again we did vaccine analysis, uh, and these are certified CDC guidelines, and again, uh, all participants receiving vaccines were registered, and IRB approved, and that kind of thing. Biostatistician took this information and put it all together. Okay. First thing we wanted to see is vaccine confidence among these individuals. And so what we see clearly is that these individuals, many of them were very confident, or somewhat confident, you know, more than 65% of them. We had some that were not confident. 
but we, are, we still want to do bivariate analysis to start looking at those that are not confident, you know, what race, what were their concerns and so forth, why we're not confident in that kind of thing. So, have you been tested for COVID? What was clear is that many people were tested for COVID, nearly 80%. And the reason being at that time, in order to keep your job, and even at Meharry, <laughs> you had to be vaccinated or you had to find another place to work. And so a lot of people were getting tested every week. And again, if you didn't vaccinate, you couldn't work there either. So at some point they said, okay, if you test every week, you can still come to work. And then they took that away as well. There were no exemptions. Unless you were uh, something in the vaccine product, you were reactive to that, causing you not to get the vaccine. And so, have you ever tested positive for COVID? And of course, yes, but most people tested negative for COVID. For a certain amount of people did test positive for COVID. But again, these are people that got tested and found out they were negative. How about those that never tested at all? So we will never know what that number is. And of course, the number of COVID tests, and again, many people were tested many times because of their job. And so, education. It was very clear around Meharry's campus a lot of folks were educated. I mean, you had to go into housing uh, projects, to, uh, you know, public housing to find people that were just GED or whatever. But most people were educated in Davidson County. And so, when we look at the gender, it turns out most people spoke English, but we had a tremendous amount of people that uh, were Hispanic and Latino that were highly motivated to get vaccinated, among the most highest in terms of those motivated to get vaccinated for COVID-19. And of course, the people that showed up, that took our surveys and got, you know, were women. And, and this was very interesting. When you look inside these numbers, women are the caretakers of the family, really. And what we found is that if the father didn't want vac to get vaccinated, the family didn't want to get vaccinated. And we've seen situations that we, you know, that women had to be a little bit creative and vaccinate their children when the, or themselves when the father was not present. And so, in terms of small businesses, and I mean, I'm sorry, employment status, what we saw that most people were employed. And again, this was a concern to us because what we saw is that during this pandemic, employment here, small businesses being able to make it and be active fell off the, uh, the cliff in 2020 because of COVID. And when we looked at those people where you had a large positive effect because of COVID, it was only about 1.6%. So COVID hurt small businesses in so many ways and uh, difficult for them to recover, especially if they were minority small businesses. And so in terms of types of insurance, a lot of folks had private insurance. A lot of folks had some kind of insurance. And in Tennessee, if you don't have insurance, you will get something that's called tin care. And this will take care of people that don't have insurance. And so in Tennessee, they would prefer you to have some type of insurance. So that was a good thing. Let me just go back here. And go, do you have health insurance or a health care plan? You can see that uh, most of them did. And the types are here. And so what you see here is what kind of confidence you have in the federal government, the CDC, the FDA, uh, your, your, uh, the government, your state government, uh, uh, your friends, social media, and the last one, I think, is, is, is your doctor. And when you look at all of these, people had a lot of confidence in the information they got from these people, but their primary care physician was, was at the top in terms of people they trusted more was their primary care physician. And so here what we see is that this number here has to change in terms of those people that are not vaccinated. This number has to change as well. And of course, for those people, you can see this is just uh, very similar here. Now I want to get into some slides that, that kind of show what we did in order to try and deal with some of this vaccine hesitancy and bring vaccine access to these medically underserved populations. So I got out there. And I was talking to everybody, and all of the magazines and newspapers wanted to talk about this, because we were doing something special at Meher. We got out in front of this. The Bloomberg Foundation to the Greenwood Philanthropist provided a million dollars for Meharry to get a mobile unit to start bringing vaccinations to people where they were in the communities. 
Again, in terms of testing and giving vaccines, we had testing facilities. Thermo Fisher Scientific provided Meharry with the infrastructure to test on campus. And of course, I was a big advocate out there. And of course, this is the first publication with Meharry Medical College in the title that is in PubMed in the history of the institution. You're looking at it right here. And again, this was about the mobile unit. And you can see that we went into government housing in order to provide vaccines. This was equipped, and I was embedded with this mobile unit. We had nurse practitioners that would ride with us, and we were giving information and vaccines to anybody who wanted them. We didn't care about your immigration status because the word was is that if you were undocumented, then you wouldn't show up at a vaccine testing site or a vaccination event. And we didn't want to play any of that game. We said, if you want a vaccine or you want to get tested, come to Meharry. That was the bottom line. And so we went to churches. The black church was very important for us to pull them into this effort. And again, we know once we had the pastors involved that we could get the congregation and draw them to get information and vaccination. So I talked in churches on Sundays and talked about the need for boosters, the need for vaccinations, and so forth. And the pastors really helped to make that possible. We went to living assisted facilities with our community health workers and our vaccine ambassadors. We also went to uh, places, nursing homes, and of course we had uh, vaccine vaccinators all around to help us with vaccinating folks. And again, vaccinating a person where they are, in churches, in parks, in living assisted facilities, and this one guy said that he couldn't take off from his job to get a vaccine. The vaccinators, and we got in my car, we went and vaccinated him on his job. And again, for pregnant women, we threw a number of community baby showers. And let me tell you, when you provide wraparound services for mothers, they will come. And so, diapers, gift bags, you name it, and they would come. And at one setting, we have 250 pregnant mothers there at one time, and providing them with everything from insurance to everything they might need in terms of babies and how to protect their babies. We came up with this idea of doing drive-in baby showers. A mother didn't even have to get out of her car to get vaccinated, and she drove in, and instead of a movie, you had information about a vaccine and how to protect your babies against, vac against COVID-19. And again, we partnered with a community, uh, <clears throat> community based organization called Help to Moms program. And again, you had moms coming from all places. And again, this is a mom putting her baby on her lap while she gets vaccinated. And the idea, again, you can see on the table a number of things that mothers need breast pumps, you name it. We had it there, and it was for free. And so, uh, again, we did this in churches where on every first Friday of the month, we provided food for people. And this was very good food, food that you can freeze away and so forth. And they basically came and made groceries in the church. But at the same time, I was there to ask them about getting a vaccine. So. And so this is a community baby shower in Nashville that we recently had. We're talking about 50 mothers in that one line right there and looking to get a vaccine information or participate in a survey. And we have specific surveys for pregnant women. Again, we stepped out and started looking at vaccinating small businesses and large businesses. Here, we vaccinated the Amazon workforce in Nashville. And again, we're talking about from 3 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. at night. And again, you know that Amazon never shuts down. So people are coming in there every hour. And we had it good here because the people, the employer made vaccinations mandatory in some ways. You know what I'm saying? Unless you had some type of an exemption. So we didn't have to fight with anybody for vaccines. They were in line to get them. On a given night, 200 vaccinations at Amazon. We know that going back to school was very important. And the idea is to bring children back to school safe means vaccinating those children. Simple as that. And so Meharry, their back-to-school immunization event, this is, from, uh, this is from July 25th to August 5th. I was embedded in the pediatrics clinic trying to give parents information they needed in order to get a vaccine. All of this was free to them. 
and, and so forth. And again, this is us at work. I mean, giving babies vaccinations and young people that are about to go to school uh, uh, was what we did. And again, this is just nurses in the pediatric clinic. And there I was sitting at that table for, I don't know, 10 days. And of course, we know that other communities in Nashville were also having a difficult time with COVID-19. We have partnered with Muslim communities. We have an ice cream social, ice cream truck that comes around, and it draws people in. So these other services and incentives, we've used them to bring people to the table to get a vaccine. And, and again, any way we can do it. We've had sororities come in. We had members of the dental school come in to help us. And we have had health fairs that are sponsored by Tennessee SEAL to make this all possible. And again, we don't want to forget about these other communities that are basically medically underserved and may be unnoticed. And that is LGBT communities, people experiencing homelessness, and migrant farm workers. We are, and again, this is something I'm writing. And again, this has been submitted for publication in the, uh, the Annals of Family Medicine. And so what I've been doing lately is writing curriculums for the COVID-19 Health Works Consortium. And again, this curriculum goes with a three hour and 47 uh, minute video. And there are a number of topics. I have uh, lectures on all of these topics. And today I presented uh, grand rounds in the hospital on, in OBGYN on pregnant women and the effects of COVID. I have these on a number of things. Uh, we have been good when it comes to publications. We are on publication number 10 now. And again, uh, we're very excited about this. I'm the special guest editor for this particular special issue. And people that are interested in submitting a manuscript to my special edition issue can do so. Uh, and again, I will have to look at it and see if it qualifies for the journal. But the journal vaccine is a journal with the highest impact factor that has the word vaccine in its title. And so we're very excited about that. I'm also going to be giving the table talk of this year AAMC meeting for Meharry. We're very excited about that as well. And it'll be on health disparities uh, associated with medically underserved population. The poster is out there. I want to thank Ms. Gwendolyn Wright, uh, Ms. Brassick as well, uh, Ms. Domowitz, uh, the leadership here at the Institute for having me. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Oh, I have so many questions. I might have to pull you in a corner Just later. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so my name is Leslie Council, and I am the Director of Health Careers and University Education at Mountain Area Health Education Center in Asheville. And um, we were actually were just at Meharry for the resident recruitment fair a couple weeks ago. Really, really, really proud of you, excited of all the things, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Oh, let me think, where do I start? So from your perspective, it is very refreshing to hear this from you as a black male physician, um, for one, because we don't have that, that type of representation in Asheville. And so all these initiatives that you have put in place, if we, we, we attempted to do within our black communities, however, they were met with such mistrust because we don't trust our health system, we don't trust the providers who were trying to force Force the vaccines onto onto our community, onto any of our patients, and myself. I was I was second guessing, yeah. and I kind of felt like um, Dr. Camisia Corzet. That was she. It's almost like she was the poster child now for the black people to to trust sure. the vaccine. But had we had more exposure to people like you, um, which leads me to the the point of of, of getting our students more interested in health careers and health paths and but they have to see someone like you who they can trust and believe that you know hearing it from you i trust more than i've trusted my own providers in western north carolina because their agendas aren't all i'm always te i'm also teaching these providers bias in healthcare and like about their microaggressions and and making sure that our patients are treated equitably um, I'm saying a whole lot, <laughs> but and, and I have like a list Understood. of questions for real. Understood. But, but I appreciate your. Um, yeah. Oh man, like. So, let me just say yeah. a few things. So <laughs> so we've had we've had public health ambassadors, and we have a program where we recruit people from communities to deliver the message, a trusted message, mm -hmm. 
to their own communities. We think this is most important. And of course, what people don't like, even when I go in the churches, if they see me come once a month, they don't like it. They want to see me more because they, they feel that I'm committed to the cause. And if you're not committed to the cause, these pastors will see right through that. And again, when you're dealing with churches, being able to interact and engage the pastor is so very important. And so we went to the point of having pastors getting a vaccination during a church session to let the whole congregation see that getting a, a vaccine was no big deal. And so we thought that that went a long way. And at the same time, we're sitting in the seats and after church session is over, I'm talking about this and the pastor's helping me and I'm recruiting people to get boosters. And, and, and before they get out of that church, I say, we got vaccinators in the vestibule of the church. Just stop over and we can give you that booster you've been waiting for for a long time. Right. Okay, so one more scientific question. Oh, absolutely. Um, as far as the, um, the people who have had COVID several times, yeah. what is there, is, is the likelihood of, of them, their boosters and vaccines, like, is that truly helpful or so, should they, have they truly developed so, those? So a person immunities? that would have COVID multiple times, there's a couple of things. They're getting infected by different variants, that one thing, okay? The other thing is that the, be, the between time in which they're boosted could have been too long. It's believed that every six months you'd be looking at another booster. And again, the virus that's out there, you want a booster that matches, meaning that if you want to deal with the B4 and B5 variant that is predominant right now in the population, you need to get that Omicron bivalent booster. Now, the Omicron bivalent booster has both the original Wuhan strain of virus protection as well as B4 and B5. It is the best thing yet. It is the first targeted vaccine that has been made. Everything before that was designed using the spike protein sequence from the original Wuha strain of virus. And so those are some of the reasons why you would get these kinds of infections. People that go to the doctor with mild to moderate cases of COVID, the first thing they will do is give you Paxlovid, okay? Paxlovid is known to give people rebound infections, but those rebound infections are relatively mild. You see what I'm saying? You're not going to go to the hospital after taking Paxlovid and getting a rebound infection. You're going to have just a little longer uh, malaise to deal with. That's the way I see it. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Ossendor. I'm Terry Schlater from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sure. Um, public health lifer here. Absolutely. Um, appreciate your work. So in, in New Mexico, University of New Mexico in the city of Albuquerque, we rely extensively on community health workers, sure. also known as promotoras and navigators. Right. Um, and our medical school has embraced them. Uh, we're a Latino serving institution. You sounds like you're embracing CHWs Absolutely. at a black, historically Absolutely. black university. How do we get medicine, the broader field of medicine to do this? I mean, community health workers are saving yeah. lives. So, so this is the thing. We, we have our hands up too, just like you. And we said, we said, we said to HRSA, give us the money for us to go out and hire 100 community health care workers to do that job for us. And HRSA responded favorably. And so that's what we've done. And so we have another three-year application that was funded to do the same thing. And that is, that's why I developed the curriculum that I showed you to train community health care workers. Everything to know about COVID is in those 13 training modules. You know what I'm saying? And then I give them a video to look at me explain all of those things that are in, that, in those modules. They also have a booklet as well. And so we're heavily dependent on community health care workers because doctors don't have the time to do this. And they won't. Now when it comes to vaccines, we think that pediatricians need to pair up with us. We need to partner with pediatricians because they're the most trusted when it comes to vaccinating particularly children. And so there has to be partnerships established there has to be people that are going to work with us. But what we're saying is that we're not going to stand by because COVID is coming. And when it gets on you, you, need, you have to deal with it. And we want to do the best for folks. And the first thing is to not get COVID in the first place and get vaccinated. My name is Pani Unawa. I'm yes. not a medical doctor, but I'm an economist. Yeah. So among the slides you showed us, like, uh, I have a scientific question. It's, you said, 
for drug development, from what you said, it takes about 16, 15 years from, it can be, from, yeah. the, from the inception before. That's right, that's right. And, but in, in the COVID case, I think it got accelerated. They we got ha everything we done had to, by, They had to do it fast. By about nine months or eight months, what you said. Yeah, they had to do it fast. So, but when they started out, initially when they started out, my understanding is that you, for regular medicine drugs, they start with about 10,000 compounds or whatever before <laughs> yeah. only one or two show up. Behavior. Yeah, but you see, they didn't have to do that with COVID. So, you see, the Chinese provided the complete sequence of the virus. All 30 kilobases were completely sequenced for the Wuhan strain. They knew that the spike protein would be the antigen that will result in neutralizing antibodies to keep the virus at bay. All of that information, that's how they could move so fast. That targeted antigen by way of exploration, and you're talking about exploration, where they go through a library of compounds to try and find something that will work. This is called drug repurposing that you're talking about. They couldn't afford to do that. The reason being is that time was of the essence no, I understand. with that many people dying. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but the thing is, they started out with the right foot then. Exactly. I mean, that exactly. was... Exactly. Was, but, but at the same time, you have to think about this. The spike protein was the antigen of choice. They chose an antigen that was neutralizing and protective, but at the same time, it was what we call hypervariable, meaning that there was a lot of mutations in the spike protein region. And again, we had never seen with the commonly circulating coronaviruses the development of, of variants. But here comes SARS-CoV-2. Oh. These variants are still going on today. So, so the other question I had is about that phase one, phase two, phase three, right, whatever you right. showed us. So when you talk about international testing, so they were doing the testing simultaneously across the countries and co calibrating the data? That's exactly right. You, you have to do it that way. So when you're doing uh, clinical trials, you have to do it within a certain time. So the clinical trials start. So the idea is that you've got distal sites that are international. You start them as well. They all have to follow the same protocols. They all have IRB approval to do that. And then there's a collection of that data that comes together to provide what you need. Now remember, they're going to institutions and clinics that know how to do this. They are not looking for people that are beginners. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Sure. So, yes, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I want to try to stretch your imagination a little bit beyond sure. your presentation today. Sure. Uh, the global level, uh, the continent of Africa, was predicted yeah. as one going to experience doom from the pandemic. Well, as we saw, uh, the infections, the vaccine, the infections, and the mortality didn't occur as they had predicted. Uh, it was the last in terms of priorities for vaccines. Yeah. Uh, how can you explain that uh, phenomenon? Like, why yeah. didn't the COVID? You yeah. Know, so, pandemic? so let me just say this: uh, we saw a lot of things. Uh, so, when, let's take, let's say, Haiti. Right now, today in Haiti. Less than 1% of Haitians have been vaccinated for COVID in this time, in this time. Let me just say this. At the beginning of this, when the vaccine first became available, countries that were high resource countries, they had 60% of vaccine contracts. We had places like Canada that had three times the vaccine they needed for their population. You only had COVAX that were getting together to try and get vaccines from countries to provide for countries in Africa. You had something also humili humiliating in my mind is that you had countries in Africa that were processing and batching vaccines and couldn't take them themselves. How about that? How about making something that you don't have access to? You're packaging vaccines and you can't take them. How about that? And so, that's humiliating in my mind. But again, vaccine contracts are simply cash. And the idea is that vaccine contracts are ordered long before the vaccines are made. And if you don't have the dollars, you simply cannot afford vaccine contracts. And, and, and that's problematic. And again, when you think about it, where's the catch up? Even the United States said we would provide millions of doses of vaccines. It's still a drop in the bucket. It's still a drop in the bucket. And the idea is that if we don't protect the developing world, how can we feel safe at all unless everybody's protected from COVID? Okay. Hi, Eric Griffith. I'm a postdoc here at the uh, Cook sure. Center. 
Um, thank you for talking about long COVID. Um, last time I was reading on that, there's like 75 or even more symptoms affiliated or associated 200 with some 200 people something. Did. Okay, <laughs> three times as many as I thought. Um, obviously, those are mostly self-reported, so very different type of data than that molecular data that you were showing us on Absolutely. the acute You're effects. Right. That's right. Um, so I'm curious, how do we go about decoupling some of the symptoms that may be secondary health effects? Because a lot of people had significant, huge lifestyle and psychological changes. Absolutely. And do we want to decouple those Absolutely. lifestyle effects, or yeah. should we count those people as having long COVID as well? Yeah. Since they're anyway, you get it. I, I think what you do is you take the definition of long COVID, and you say if you had long COVID, first of all, to say you have long COVID, you have had COVID, and then you have to have symptoms that at least goes beyond four weeks. And if it's 12 weeks, you're considered to have po chronic post-COVID syndrome. And it turns out that when you think about COVID, every time you get infected with COVID, you have the chance of getting long COVID. People don't understand, especially people that are not vaccinated. And again, there are people that have COVID that have had this for many, many years. And again, I agree with you that differential diagnosis is a must. The reason being is that you have individuals that have long COVID, and remember, a risk factor for long COVID was older age, meaning that they have concomitant uh, certain types of pre-existing conditions that could be reminiscent of diseases like long COVID. However, we're up against this. There's no screening test for long COVID. There's no guidelines that are documented for symptoms that classify you as having long COVID. And again, you're gonna be treated for individual symptoms with long COVID. And the best treatment are at teaching hospitals that include specialty clinics that would not be allowed for people, people would have to travel long distance to go to Mount Sinai to be part of their long COVID study. Who has the money to go to New York City and wait in line for that to get in that trial or whatever? I want to say that there are many long COVID trials, too many to talk about. Anywhere from uh, holistic medications to exercise regimens to treat long COVID. And let me tell you, there's still no answer. And, and uh, again, this is going to be very important that we deal with this because long COVID could be with us long after COVID is gone. I don't think that's going to happen because I think these variants will continue. And so I appreciate your question, and, and I'm very interested in knowing more about your question. So I've developed a, a, uh, a lecture on long COVID as well. Uh, I, I'll probably give that to the OBGYN uh, residents soon, and so I'm very excited about that. But your question is well taken. Thank you. Yeah, last question. I'm going to try to keep it very short. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing work in the community. There is so much need, right? And I think, you know, one question I had, I, I am a behavioral economist who is sure. interested in sure. um, helping Latino families to have of access course. to information about vaccines for children, right? right. COVID-19 vaccines. Mm -hmm. And I, I work with an MD from uh, UCLA, and we have created uh, Mi Vacuna LA for sure. the Latino community. So my question... Um, do you have any ideas of like as we reach different communities, right? I mean, of course, language is one big piece, right? But there is also, you know, the um, the cultural appropriate interventions, right? right? If you have any suggestions there, and then also we've been successful using text messages. Oh, absolutely. So you probably awesome. use that so too. So I give you an idea. When okay. we were doing vaccine trials on Meharry's campus, this was Novavax and Moderna asked Meharry to participate in their vaccine trials. They told us we need 15 Hispanic families to be a part of this. And so I was saying to myself, how can we do this? We were racking our brains to try and do this. What I did is that my Spanish is not good enough to get me arrested. You know what I'm saying? But the idea was this, is that I got myself a, a person that had been on the radio with a Spanish audience for years. Oh. And at the same time, we brought in a translator and the combination of her translating what I said to that audience, the phone was off the hook when I finished a one hour Facebook okay. Live. And so I just feel that uh -huh. you have to approach communities in a cultural context in a way that they understand. Oh. And if you don't, you lose the message. Even yeah. though it's a trusted message, you can lose it by way of language barriers. And so what we do is that we partner with people. Okay. We have nurse practitioners that speak Spanish 
that goes out into the community at our vaccination events, and every flyer that we have is in Spanish. Great. Thank you, nothing's for sharing.